I'm Beth Lewis, co-founder of Save Our Schools Arizona. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us tonight. We're going to focus on how the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting our school and our state budgets and the role that federal relief funding will play. So I'd really like to extend a warm welcome to our panelists, Superintendent of Public Instruction, Kathy Hoffman, Tucson Unified Superintendent, Dr. Gabriel Trujillo, and David Lujan from the Arizona Center of Economic Progress. So we're gonna get started with David, who will give us a little bit of background on how the COVID pandemic is impacting our state revenues and um, some of the lessons that we learned from the last economic downturn. Thank you, Beth. Um, yes, so since we'll be talking about the financial impact on Arizona's public schools from the COVID pandemic, I thought I'd start by first giving a little bit of context on what the state budget overall is looking like. So back in January, Arizona was actually looking pretty good. We had about a billion dollars in revenue in excess of our current expenditures. And then of course the, the COVID pandemic hit and the stay at home orders and the economic uh, shutdowns and that changed the whole picture. And um, it's been changing a little bit. Um, in April, the Joint Legislative Budget Committee estimated that Arizona was facing a $1.1 billion shortfall for the current, for, for the fiscal year that ended on June 30th and the current fiscal year that we're in combined. Um, but then uh, they, but they said at the time that that was very uncertain because we have never been through an economic shutdown like this where everything is just shut down. So it's very hard to predict. Um, and so since that time, some good news is that the revenue picture for the current or from the fiscal year that just ended uh, looks a little bit better. So it doesn't look like we'll have a shortfall for the fiscal year that just ended. Um, but going forward, uh, the picture is still looking not too good. And I'll share my screen now to show you um, what that's looking like. And so this is from the nonpartisan Joint Legislative Budget Committee. And the report that they gave just uh, a couple, about a week ago shows that for the current fiscal year that started July 1st, they are still estimating a $518 million budget shortfall. And then the legislature that's elected in November when they take office in January, um, I don't know if they'll still want to run because they will be facing a $720 million budget shortfall. That's what's projected currently by the Joint Legislative Budget Committee. And then for the year after that, fiscal year 2023, it's still projected to be a $293 million budget shortfall. So I added all together over the next three years, one and a half billion dollar shortfall. And what JLBC has been very adamant in saying is that these numbers are, and this with their own words, extremely speculative um, because they just don't know because this has been such an unusual pandemic or an economic shutdown like we've never seen before. And, and, um, and so we just don't know like if the government, if we're gonna have to shut down again, if there's gonna be more spikes. So, um, but this is what we're looking at currently. And why this is significant is that looking back to what happened during our last economic downturn, the Great Recession in 2008, during the Great Recession, um, public education took the largest cuts of to get out of that, that recession. Um, no state in the country cut more from public education from 2008 to 2014. And Arizona still hasn't restored all of the cuts that they made from the last recession back in 2008. And one of the things that was so important back during the Great Recession was that we received a lot of federal aid to help deal with that budget shortfall. Had we not received that federal aid, those cuts would have been even more severe, if you can imagine that. And so Beth and I will be talking a little bit more about that at the end of the presentation tonight, um, but just wanted to keep in mind that that was such a big help to us in 2008 was those federal dollars. And so, so that's, that's why um, the state's budget and where we're at with the state budget is so important and, and having that context as we enter into this discussion. So I will turn it back to Beth um, to introduce Superintendent Hoffman. Thank you, David. I feel like that information is really probably scary for a lot of us out there, parents and teachers and citizens, but it's important to know that information so we can act with urgency and listen to our leaders. 
So thank you so much, Superintendent Hoffman, for being here. We're honored to have you here with us. We are hoping to uh, maybe hear a rundown of what's ahead for Arizona's public schools. And with that, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Beth. Um, first, I just want to say, you know, so it's been about a year and a half since I took office, and I feel very fortunate that I spent much of the first year traveling the state, visiting our schools. I went to school from every single county in Arizona and visited over 100 schools. And the reason I mention that is because that was such a good foundation for me now in this once in a lifetime, hopefully, <laughs> pandemic crisis situation that I had already built so many relationships around the state and also have a really good sense of the different types of school communities and, and their needs. And so I've stayed in very close communication with the educators, with the principals and superintendents, even students. I have my student advisory council as well that, I'm, that we're still meeting. And, and so I just wanted to start with that, that I just feel so fortunate that because right now it's more important than ever that we're advocating that we, um, you know, our schools are such a critical lifeline for our families, for our parents, for our communities, and thinking about all the types of services that they provide. You know, since March, our schools in the spring had provided well over 10 million meals to families. Um, so all the, all the support, social emotional supports. I know so many teachers who are going above and beyond to call or text their students and checking in on their wellness. Um, so I just wanted to make sure to start with how important that having this advocacy work is and thinking about the needs of our schools during this crisis. Um, so we've been very busy in the Department of Education ever so speaking specifically about since March, since the beginning of this crisis. Um, when we had the school closures, we have been going, our, all my teams in the department have really been trying to meet the needs of our schools and to, to serve our school communities. And so one of the ways we have done that is we convened a task force for reopening schools in the spring that had well over 100 professionals and um, experts came together and they created the roadmap for reopening schools. We knew when that was published in the late spring that that was a first version that we expected to be updated. We knew that it was really hard to predict what this next school year would look like. And so we said from the beginning that we, we knew updates would be needed and that we needed to be planning for all scenarios, for schools to be open, for schools to be closed, for um, distance learning, for intermittent open and close. So um, the roadmap encompasses all of that. We also have various sections targeted towards supports for teachers, supports for students, and so we tried to make it really comprehensive. And, and throughout it, we integrate social emotional supports as well. All of those documents and resources are on our website. If you go to the Arizona Department of Education website, we have tons of resources there, also for families, um, different kinds of resources, and we are constantly updating that. And um, we also, one of the things that our schools have been um, grappling with is there's been a constant change of new policies, both at the federal level and at the state level. And it's really hard for our schools to be navigating this constant change of new policies, new requirements. And, and sometimes the new policies are good and we're getting new flexibilities or waivers and things like that. But some of it has also been really challenging. So we have also been um, working really hard to provide different types of guidance documents and webinars to make sure that we're all staying on the same page. Again, all of those um, resources are on our website. And then I, um, one of our highest priorities also, something that's been really eye-opening for us through um, this, having the school closure in the spring and then going into this next school year, one of the most eye-opening pieces of it all has been the digital divide. And I imagine Dr. Trujillo will also speak to this because I know we've talked about this before, but um, this every single day that Arizona schools are closed is truly devastating for our students, even though we, we absolutely need to make sure schools are, um, that it's safe for schools to open before we do so. But at the same time, it's, it's devastating knowing that so many of our students still do not have adequate access to technology or internet at home. Um, we estimate that it's around 200,000 students in Arizona that do not have adequate internet at home. And when you think about the quality of instruction, when you compare an online class to packet learnings, it's just incomparable. 
So um, that's something we've been working really hard to address. I convened a technology task force that's made up of uh, tech experts from around the state, as well as technology directors from school districts and teachers and students. And we actually had our third meeting last night. And so we're, we're really trying to build those private public partnerships and, and figure out plans for how to best serve our schools um, when it comes to issues of the, in regards to the digital divide. Um, I wanna talk, I know one of the questions I had received to discuss was about the federal funding that we're receiving. Um, so Arizona received uh, $277 million of CARES Act funding that we're in the process of allocating out to our schools. Um, so that this CARES Act funding is quite flexible in how schools can spend it. I know when I've talked with some of our school leaders, many of them are using their CARES Act funding for, um, for distance learning. So purchasing technology like laptops or hotspots. Um, they are sometimes um, purchasing new types of technology or platforms for their students to get online. Uh, some of the funding can be used for things like PPE or uh, just getting creative. <laughs> There's a lot of flexibility in it. So I know um, our schools are, are thinking through that. So, some, some of the money I know is going towards um, positions, but that's really hard because one thing I want to emphasize about this CARES Act funding is that it's one-time funding. It's not sustained. So we are strongly advocating at the federal level for the HEROES Act to add to, um, to the education funding through federal funds. But at this time, we just have the CARES Act funding, which is that one-time funding. Um, there's also a portion of the CARES Act funding that, that the department had jurisdiction over how to, how to allocate that. And so we were able to pick a couple areas that we wanted to focus on. It's, it's not a lot of money, but we're putting a couple million dollars towards compensatory special education services, a um, couple million dollars towards professional development for teachers who are doing distance learning. Um, we're also putting some, some of that funding towards uh, social emotional trainings for teachers. So those types of things that are some of our priorities. And let's see. Then another area, I know we have, there's a lot going on in the department, but um, one of the areas I also want to make sure to mention when we're thinking about the digital divide is um, thinking about how rural Arizona is, and there are still many parts of the state that do not have the infrastructure for broadband internet. So for those areas, we're very supportive of what's called the E-rate program, which is federal funding that helps to build out the broadband infrastructure out to schools and libraries. And so we've already done tons of multi-million dollar projects across the state to, um, to expand broadband internet, but we would be very supportive and we've been advocating for this um, when, when speaking with our congressional representatives of expanding the E-rate program and, and um, adding to that funding. For our urban areas where there tends to be better internet infrastructure, we are also working to advocate that, um, that our internet providers, that they have um, affordable plans for families and um, because that's a good way to, to give more access. And, and then related to that, for the affordable plans that an internet company might offer, we are also advocating that the speed of the internet is a high speed internet rather than um, this, you know, when you have an affordable plan that's at a, a slower bandwidth, it's really not equitable. If you think about from student to student, every student needs high quality internet. And especially when that's how they're accessing their learning, it's more important than ever. So those are the types of things that we're advocating for when it comes to the federal programs and the federal funding. And then another um, piece of the CARES Act funding is there, and I know there was, this was in the news a bit, but it's getting a little bit into the weeds, but there was this portion um, that is referred to as the equitable services. And the US Department of Education and Secretary DeVos, they, um, they try to, they have been attempting to um, put into place an administrative interim rule that we do not agree with. Um, and so we have been advocating that the CARES Act funding remain true to the letter of the law. And this, to sum it up, 
um, there's already a formula by which public schools um, that Title I students in our private schools receive funding. And we just, we're advocating that we stick to the letter of the law rather than expanding that in any way. Um, so that's another way that we're protecting our public school dollars is, a, is another way to put that. Um, so just in closing, we, <laughs> I know that was a lot to cover. Um, there's so many different areas that our department is working to support our schools on, whether it be special education services, um, serving our students who are, are multilingual and still learning English, our, um, our students in rural communities, our Native American communities that have been hit so hard through this crisis. So we have a lot of work happening across the agency that I would love to brag on, but I, I only have limited time here. So I'm going to wrap up there, but I will be available for questions at the end. Thank you so much, Superintendent Hoffman. I know as a teacher, it's really nice to hear about all of the work that's happening and we're so grateful to you for your leadership. And we I definitely have a lot of questions coming in, but we invited uh, Dr. Gabriel Trujillo from Tucson Unified School District to also present to get a little bit of the perspective from kind of boots on the ground and, and from a district leader. So, I want to welcome Dr. Trujillo and thank you for your time and I have a couple questions um, for you as to sort of the challenges that schools are facing. Um, well, thank well uh, thank you very much and Beth of course I'm going to embarrass you. I do this every time I'm at a Save Our Schools event. This is the absolute most inspirational organization that stands up and defends our public schools anytime they're threatened. Your uh, your campaign against Proposition 305 was inspiring. And anytime SOS needs me, you just have to say where and I will be there. So thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. Uh, Superintendent Hoffman, I wanna thank you. Uh, the roadmap to reopening was a very, very early guiding document for us uh, as we began to think about how we were going to operate in this pandemic environment. And so, we are pretty much at the end of a very long collaborative process. We spent the months of May and June just listening. I facilitated uh, just shy of 25 different town halls with our employees, with our parents, with our teachers, uh, with ed people, anybody that wanted to attend in the community, just before we even had the idea of what could be a viable model in these tremendously difficult circumstances. We wanted to hear what the fears were, what the, what the concerns were, where the shortfalls were with our first round of pandemic school, which was March to May, right? So what went well, what didn't go well. And from that process, we headed into July, having interacted with almost a thousand different stakeholders. We even had a virtual town hall with our employee association, uh, our teachers association. And so we headed into July with some themes. And one of the biggest uh, theme that emerged from the various town halls is what this pandemic has produced, what the confusion from this administration in Washington has produced, what the last minute decision making we've seen out of the legislature has produced is an unintentional conflict of interests, wants, and preferences that have inadvertently pitted stakeholders against each other. You, what we learned very early was our teachers and our employees demanding safety, worried for their families, scared for what could happen coming back into schools, wanting schools closed as long as possible until we can get hard metrics out of our county and state health departments. Then you've got 40,000 families saying, it's not that we're not scared, we have economic need. We don't wanna lose our jobs over this. Uh, particularly our K-5 families that uh, largely working class here in Tucson Unified, largely Title I areas, largely blue collar jobs that could very easily lose a job over this uh, if we totally 100% uh, shut the schools down. So what we wanted to do was to come up with a model that not necessarily would make everybody happy, but would encompass the greatest amount of wants and preferences from our families and from our employees. We heard very clearly from our teachers, fear, nervousness, anxiety about coming back. But if they had to come back, we knew we had to get class sizes as low as possible, as close to 10 as we possibly could so that we could implement 
all of the CDC recommended precautionary measures. We heard that devices were a problem with our families. We heard that uh, families that could have three or four TUSD kids in the home were still only having one device and still not necessarily getting the access to their teachers. We heard internet was an issue, not just for our families, but also for our uh, teachers. Our teachers were also experiencing uh, the challenge of paying that internet bill because it's high speed internet, it's unlimited data. It's not the $20 package. If you're gonna do Zoom video calls for 30 or 40 kids, you need the unlimited data package. We also heard that we needed one standardized model. We wanted uh, to stop having to be reactive to every time an announcement was made, what kind of model were we gonna run? We wanted to create a model that was gonna allow us to take control and function no matter what environment that we were going to be in. So what we've rolled out is a uh, one universal online model for everybody. So regardless of whether you're sitting at home you will be receiving your lessons facilitated via Zoom. You'll have access to our instructional software platforms. If you're a student that elects an online learning space, you're gonna sit behind a computer on our campus and get the same digital virtual experience that everybody else is gonna get. This standardizes the instructional experience, makes sure there's no gap in access and equity between the students learning from home or the students that are learning in school. It keeps, it allows us to keep our on-site learning spaces as close to 10 as possible. So we're facilitating those small groups. It allows us to eliminate transition periods because we're keeping small cohorts of kids in a very small environment where we can do the masks and do the distancing and do the cleanliness protocols. And it allows us to be flexible. It's one model. So once our teachers come in for PD, and once we teach it to our students, it really, it doesn't matter if we face a large scale closure, maybe later on when COVID-19 collides with the flu season, our students aren't gonna have to learn anything new. Our teachers are not gonna have to go through another round of PD to learn a brand new model. It's got socio-emotional learning lessons built in uh, several times a week. So no matter where our kids are, they're going to be having access to our counselors and our social workers, whether remote or whether online. The challenge with all of this is the price tag. Uh, it is going to cost Tucson Unified $13.5 million uh, to open up this school year, and that's just to get the school year open. TUSD already received, we received uh, eight, or just shy of $18 million in CARES Act money. We had to turn around and give $2 million to all of the charter and private schools that are in our zone, only to find out weeks later that on top of that, they also got those, um, those PPP loans uh, that are given to small business operators, those payroll protection loans. So that was like salt in an open financial wound uh, that we had to absorb already. So at the end of the day, we were operating with 17 million. We already had to uh, allocate 13 and a half million uh, just to get schools open. Inside of that 13 and a half million, you, we have already spent uh, just around uh, four and a half million uh, for technology purchases for this year alone for 10,000 devices to go out and carry us forward into being a one-to-one -one district. Inside of the 10,000 devices, we have 2,000 brand new laptops for our teachers uh, who are struggling with device uh, not having a device or having an antiquated device. We've also built into the budget, thanks to our governing board uh, for approving this, by the way, a quarter of a million dollars, $250,000 will now handle high-speed internet costs for families across the district that don't have it, and also high-speed internet costs for our teachers that struggle to meet that financial obligation every single month as well. We are now almost $2 million in additional custodial staff to keep up with the aggressive sanitation protocols in our schools. And um, that is also inclusive of extra monitors that now have to come into the schools and help us supervise learning spaces and also make sure that we're facilitating the one-way directional traffic and hallways and the lunches and the recesses. So that's, that's a little bit about uh, TUSD. And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit later on about some of the bigger ticket legislative challenges as well.
that we're facing outside of the financial. Sure, yeah, that was really illuminating just getting to hear through the lens of one district and what you all are doing and I want to hear more. So <laughs> I know we only have about 10 minutes left with Superintendent Hoffman. So I want to make sure to kind of ask both of you some questions. Um, Superintendent Hoffman, you've yesterday you asked the governor to use public health data to determine reopening um, and also ask for guaranteed full funding for distance learning. So can you kind of explain your rationale there um, and just give some voice to it? Sure. Um, so yeah, there were, these were, when I had to boil it down, you know, there's lots of things we want to see in the next executive order. But when I kind of boil down, what are my top priorities? What, what do our teachers need? What do our schools need for stability, for uh, making good decisions going forward? It's these two things. It's that they know the funding will be there, that they can rely on it. And I know, you know, especially just listening to Superintendent Trujillo, that funding piece is critical. And um, when, when we're talking about distance learning, I think it's really important for everyone to be understanding that just because students might be learning online and they're not in the classroom, it is more expensive for schools. And so I think Superintendent Trujillo just described that perfectly of, how much more it's costing our schools to be able to educate students when they're not in the building. But yes, we still need to pay for the buildings and all the maintenance and the cleaning. And so that's why we're seeing such a, um, such a need right now. And I, I just wanted, I, I think sometimes there's a misconception that this online learning is somehow cheaper for schools, so they might need less money. So that was where that piece came from, was making sure that our schools are fully funded. So they, so they have that, reassurance so they can keep paying all their staff and um, and hopefully we're going to get you know back to school someday but that's not in the near future and not in the unfortunately not in the not as soon as we would like it to be so that gets to the second point which is how do we how do we know when it's how does a school know how does the school board specifically because a lot of these decisions are being made at the school board level so how does the school board know when they should open based on public health data. And at, this, you know, at the state level, we've been looking at um, data and making those decisions for the statewide closures, as we saw in the spring and as we saw with the delay of schools to August 17th. But going forward, eventually we are also going to get to a point where those decisions could be made at a more local level. It could be potentially more at the county level, for example. And so we have been working closely with the Department of Health Services and started um, having more conversations with the county health directors. And that's something that, um, that all of us in education think is really important to have a framework and metrics to point to. So we're all, so we all have the same targets, so we know so we, how do we know when we're um, when it's safe to open? It, it can provide that reassurance to our educators and staff, um, and and we have there's a lot of there's a lot of need for that because right now that decision is falling on our school boards and it it's they're not epidemiologists they are elected to represent their community and their schools. Um, they are not meant to be making these types of public, they are, that's just not, that's not their expertise typically. So that's why we think it's really important to have metrics to point to. And there was, um, there was a question that's related to this, so I'll just kind of piggyback. Um, there are a lot of sort of rumors floating around and, and some districts that have come out and said that they're, they don't feel like they're able to make a decision about going fully online because of this funding issue. Um, so maybe you could answer, will schools, as it currently stands prior to the governor's press conference, would schools lose their uh, chunk of funding if they went fully online for first quarter? We're, so we're still working through those details and our school finance team has been working very diligently to, to work through this current, this system that's being created. Um, it's a different funding model than what we're used to. And so that's why, again, it was really important for me to say, we need full funding, we need assurances that our schools will be fully funded. Um, so we are still working through those details. Dr. Trujillo looked like he wanted to jump in. I probably have a little bit more latitude to answer this than our uh, esteemed uh, state superintendent. 
the way the executive order is written, it requires Arizona schools and districts to offer a free um, and accessible learning space on campuses uh, for families that need a physical attendance option. Uh, in order to be able to get the enrollment stabilization grant monies that are listed or, or that are um, memorialized in the executive order, you need to comply with this provision. Uh, if a district, the way it's written now, now I understand there's work being done to see if this can be addressed, but the way it's written now, if a district makes the decision to just say, you know, we're just 100% closed, there will be no uh, access to any physical learning spaces until we receive uh, real metrics about the virus that guide our decision making, that district will not be eligible for an enrollment stabilization grant, which means that any loss of enrollment that that district experiences will not be able to be reimbursed um, through this mechanism that the executive order creates. And also because of the inequities in funding per student for online learning versus physically attending, you're taking a hit of 5% per student by moving the entire student body for nine weeks. So in TUSD land, that looks like $215 less per student times 45,000. We lose $5 million immediately, $5 million hit to just say we are all closed down until say even just October. So every nine weeks, that's our bill uh, at 5% less per student on top of losing any money that we could lose uh, by not being eligible for the enrollment stabilization grant. Uh, we of course are counting on Superintendent Hoffman to work her magic. <laughs> She's got a sphere of influence larger than ours at the superintendent level. But that is our concern. Uh, I know as, as superintendents in Pima County, this is our recurring discussion every single week when we meet. Mm -hmm. So we can see why that was such a key piece um, in Superintendent Hoffman's announcement yesterday. And if you are so inclined to you know, reach out to the governor, for example, um, I think that that's a very common sense, reasonable plea to ask for no punitive damages for schools that are trying to keep their teachers and students safe. As a teacher, I know that we are all gonna jump into the next question. There's a lot of uncertainty for parents out there, a lot of uncertainty for teachers. So, um, and, and a lot of the questions that we're getting are sort of specific situations, which we can address all of them, but I think it speaks to that underlying uncertainty about what will happen if I get it and what will happen, you know, with individual schools and buses and aides. But, I guess I'd like to know your advice for what we can do now to prepare for the unknown. Since a lot of us are being asked to return in a couple of weeks and um, losing a lot of sleep over it. Yeah, these, I just want to acknowledge that that fear, um, that concern. I mean, this, this um, virus has impacted so many of us already. I learned of a, a friend recently that um, I just learned had been tested positive. I mean, it's definitely impacted many people within our own communities. And so that that causes more fear, more anxiety when it's just so prevalent these days. Um, so in terms of what we can be doing to prepare, I would say for our educators and staff out there, um, keeping close communication with your school admin is really important. Um, I sent a letter recently to all of our school leaders, to principals, superintendents, um, anyone who's on our listserv, which I think is a pretty far reach. And, and I urge them, I think hopefully Superintendent Trujillo saw this too, I urge them to please be elevating your teacher voices. Please be like, holding virtual meetings with them, calling them individually, reaching out to them because um, that's part of what it's going to take to, to have the trust of what around the decisions that are being made, that teachers and staff need to be part, have a voice in the decision-making process or else they're not gonna trust the decisions that are being made and it's gonna be really hard for them to return. And I, I already know of a lot of teachers who have made that really difficult decision to resign. I've been hearing more and more of that and people have been reaching out to me personally to let me know of that difficult decision. And so I know people are thinking about 
what's best for their family, especially those who already have a medical condition or someone close to them with a medical condition. These are extremely difficult and challenging times and there's, I wish there was something more reassuring I could say, um, but this is unprecedented and, and it is scary. And, um, but we need to also, we need to make sure we're having really good communication with each other and, and having an understanding that it's, that it's really hard to plan ahead in these circumstances. So we're, as education leaders, we're doing everything we can to plan for all scenarios. But, um, but it is, it's really hard for education leaders to be making any of these decisions right now when it's hard to know what the outcomes will be. Yep, thank you. And I know that you have to jump off. I want to respect your time, but we appreciate you being here with us so much. And I don't know if you want to give any, like a closing remark. I think that was kind of a closing in itself, but um, thank you so much for the time, the conversation, really good to see you all. And um, if anyone had, again, yeah, I would encourage people to go to our Arizona Department of Education website to the COVID-19 resources because there's so much there for teachers, families, um, anyone who would like to check that out. And then if you have um, specific questions that I would encourage using the email questions at azed.gov and then that gets directed to where it needs to go if you have other specific questions, but thank you all. Thank you so much. So Dr. Trujillo, I don't know if you wanted to take on that question about things that teachers and or parents could be doing, um, and maybe specifically in districts that haven't given clear guidance. I think that you um, have really led the charge in terms of um, making a very clear plan, and I imagine that parents and teachers have really um, you know, appreciated having clarity but maybe for uh, so many other people across the state that just really don't know what's going to be happening. Well, I, I 100% I agree with, with Superintendent Hoffman. I mean, we've done numerous virtual town halls and people just want to be heard. Uh, but we're working very closely with our associations. They've been on our team uh, in terms of our task force for reopening. We've had a large task force. Uh, 50 different individuals, classroom teachers, site administrators, association leaders. And we're even doing three more town halls uh, post plan because we unveiled our plan uh, at the last uh, governing board meeting. And now people have had time to look at it. Now we're going to do three town halls, three virtual town halls uh, coming up this week. So people now can ask questions about what the model looks like. My advice to, to leaders right now is, is I've, I've got like three really big, big pieces of advice because I know that there's a lot of school leaders that are hesitant to jump out there and provide details um, because they're afraid of, you know, if I provide all these details and then stuff changes, you got to jump out there now. You got to jump out there now because the anxiety that the employees feel and that the parents feel the quicker they get access to information or the quicker they get a picture of what pandemic school. One of our board members, I, 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 it's my favorite term, uh, Mrs. Grohald on our board, she coined the term pandemic school. That's exactly what we have. And what the parents have to understand, they have to have a clear picture of what life at the school is going to look like. And when you, when you give that to them, it's going to be rough in the beginning because they have a picture of school that's radically different than what school's going to be once you implement all the social distancing and all the masks and all the sanitation protocols and all the CDC precautionary measures. And they need to know what that is. And they need to know what that is sooner rather than later. Secondly, if, if, you, if your district has not developed a protocol for what the district and what your schools are going to do when people present with symptoms, that has to be front and center. That is probably one of, gonna be one of the most important protocols that you're going to have to develop and, you, and you're gonna need to develop it sooner rather than later. And, and lastly, the instructional model is big. And if you have not finalized an instructional model, not everybody is gonna be happy with it. Uh, we have a lot of our parents that, um, the parents that we see a lot, Dr. Trio, you need to open up the schools, okay? 
And not only do you need to open up the schools, we want all the project-based learning like it was, we want all the cooperative learning structures, we want music, we want dance, we want everything as it was, okay? And not only do we want everything as it was, nobody better get sick, everybody better be six feet apart, everybody be wearing masks. Well, I can't put our educators in that kind of a spot. So the parents have been asked to give because we can't put our teachers in that kind of a position and making them facilitate all the project-based learning and kids in groups. And we'd run the risk of turning our classrooms into super spreader machines. So the parents have had to come to grips with what pandemic school looks like. Ours now understand it and we're starting to see them make selections of just going online. And I, I really do think that it's key for school leaders that you, you have to get out there and show them really what pandemic school is going to look like in your district. And I think one of the most powerful uh, mechanisms that the parents have, if they're not hearing a lot from their districts right now, is to really email their governing board members, email principals, that's gonna start generating some answers. Governing board members, I know in our district, they're incredibly responsive. And all it takes is a group of parents to bring an issue to the attention, and it's gonna get on the administration's radar fairly quickly. And I think that's pretty standard across the state. Governing board members wanna know that employees are being, the employee concerns are being heard, that families are being heard, and that could also be a very powerful mechanism for parents to start getting some information if they feel that their respective district is not moving quick enough with communication or plan. Yeah. Well, and I think everything that you just laid out um, definitely speaks to the need for clarity, but also the need for funding, right? I mean, a lot of people ask, well, why do you always need funding? And I think they don't realize how much we do. And when you put it in those terms, you start to see how much schools do and how difficult uh, the pandemic has made you know, made it and we need double the buses, double the bus drivers, or we need more classrooms, we need more teachers, we need more counselors, and there are a lot of needs. Um, so with that, I, I want to flip it over to David for a bit. Um, hopefully we'll have time for a little Q&A at the end. But um, David, if you could kind of explain to us the importance of additional federal fiscal relief, I think we've touched on it a few times, but you're the expert. Thank you. Um, well, so yeah, I think what's what's uh, really hit home for me in listening to Superintendents Hoffman and Trujillo is the additional costs that we're going that we, all schools in Arizona are facing because of the COVID pandemic. And as we all know, going into this pandemic, Arizona schools were already struggling when it came to funding. We are 48th in the nation in per pupil funding. And, and we are, we're in the midst of a teacher shortage crisis going into this. And, and you hear the stories of teachers that might not be going back to the classroom when schools reopen. And, and, and so that's only going to exacerbate our teacher shortage crisis and in, you know, increase the de financial demands on all of our schools. And so, and then I, I presented at the beginning the, the state budget shortfalls that we're facing and so that is why federal fiscal relief is going to be so important to help schools particularly deal with these sort of one-time costs that they're experiencing in dealing with the COVID pandemic. And I say one-time costs because it's, you know, hopefully we'll, you know, have a vaccine and, and this will go away um, or at least decrease. But, you know, so the federal dollars, the federal fiscal relief is so important to help our schools and to help our state budget deal with that budget crisis. Um, and it also is important for other reasons because the federal fiscal relief package that we're seeking is not only additional relief for schools and school budgets and to help balance state budget shortfalls, but also for a lot of things that really help educate our children, things like SNAP, which is food assistance. I'm sure Superintendent Trujillo and, and Beth, you as a teacher know that if, if a a student is, is not getting sufficient food, if they're coming to school hungry, that impacts their ability to learn and to get an education. Um, also housing assistance. You could have the best teachers and the best curriculum in the world, but if a, a child is homeless or if they're having to switch homes and move schools three or four times during the course of a year, that impacts their ability to get an education. And then of course, unemployment benefits. If, if their if their parents have lost a job due to the COVID crisis, you know those 
continuation of unemployment benefits are gonna be so critical to provide the financial st stability that families need. And all of those things are gonna be included, hopefully in the next financial relief package that Congress is passing. And, that, and that's why, you know, we'll talk about it, I think in a moment, but why it's gonna be so important to, to have um, our senators make sure that they are supporting these things for our schools. Um, but I'll share my screen because Beth, I think you also wanna talk about we want the federal fiscal relief for our public schools, but it's also gonna be critical because those tax dollars are so rare and so hard to get for our public schools. We don't wanna see them being diverted to private schools. So I'll share my screen and you can talk about that piece. Yeah, so I think in Arizona, people have become uh, pretty familiar with uh, private school vouchers with Prop 305 and um, everything else that we've had to fight in our state. But a lot of people don't know that $264 million are already diverted to private school vouchers every single year. And so, you know, at Save Our Schools and many of our partner organizations have um, worked to really fight against any further expansion of that funding while we are, like David said, 48th in the nation. And, per people spending. Um, recently, I think Kathy, or Superintendent Hoffman touched on this earlier that um, Betsy DeVos, our Secretary of Education, has issued a rule to divert federal Title I funding to private schools. Um, we actually, uh, there was a lawsuit issued today by the NAACP, the Southern Poverty Law Center, and um, several plaintiffs around the country including myself to stay uh, that rule, enjoying that rule and make sure that that cannot happen. Um, but at the state level, governors have full discretion over that funding. So, you know, again, if you are reaching out to Governor Ducey, um, I think it's, it's good to use the word public in your language and say, we need more funding and we need that funding to go to our public schools and not, you know, be scraped out through any other um, voucher mechanisms. And then I, I guess I'll, I can just take it from here and just, you know, continuing what I was just mentioning again is, um, so Congress reconvened this past week, um, just today, I believe, or yesterday, Senator McConnell announced sort of the details of some of his proposal, uh, which don't include many of the things that we've been talking about here, don't include the additional funding for state fiscal relief, for SNAP, unemployment assistance, housing, all those things are missing. And so really it's gonna be so critical for us to contact, uh, starting with our senators, Senator McSally and Senator Sinema, to make sure that they are supporting these things in the next fiscal relief package. And so I provided uh, the link to the Save Our Schools Arizona website where they have a really great resource on there. If you go to their website to be able to contact our senators and make sure that you are calling them to action to, to really support these things. So, Beth? Yes, please, please, please do. If you go to that website, there are a lot of very handy tools. Um, there's a clickable button to uh, Senator McSally's Phoenix office, her Tucson office, and several others. Same with Senator Cinema. I know um, we've heard reports that phones have been ringing off the hook when we issue um, emails and, and calls to action. So please do um, get engaged. You heard Dr. Trujillo talking about the huge financial burden that districts are bearing right now. Um, I know that Senator Cinema said today in a news article that she is requesting expansion of help for veterans, um, funding for housing and resources and additional funding for K-12 schools and tribal schools to pay for digital devices and digital infrastructure. So, um, you know, the calls to action are working and I think people are, um, you know, Washington is moving in the right direction, but it's, it's very critical that everybody in our state gets involved and asks our senators to do the right thing um, because things, you know, get politicized and it shouldn't be that way. We know that uh, both of our senators support Arizona and our kids and our schools. All right. Um, well, Dr. Trujillo, do you want to leave us with any closing remarks about what to expect in the next few weeks? Or yeah, I, I, I think there's there's two very very important um, very important points here. Uh, we we need a delay to the physical opening of school. 
and uh, I urge uh, the governor to consider extending that order. Uh, I think as long as we, we've touched on this during this call, it is not fair to put that pressure on governing board members and governing boards across the state. That's not their role. Uh, the governor's office should make the call here, especially if we're talking about opening schools responsibly. If we see the kind of numbers that we're seeing. And then also, if we really do want to open school responsibly, there are some very serious problems in the supply chain for a lot of the vital resources that we need for cleaning and sanitation. And with the race towards some sort of an August 17th uh, reopening, that is gonna be a huge challenge and it's gonna leave a lot of districts compromised with key resources like hand sanitizer, antibacterial soap, paper towels, masks, and gloves. Secondly, at some point, the legislature is going to have to deal with AZ Merit. It is absolutely not fair to basically overhaul the instructional environment. You basically strip down the instructional environment. We have taken away all of the vital tools and strategies and resources that are usually at a teacher's disposal, project-based learning, team-based activities, cooperative learning structures, all that is gone. We now have a significant learning gap of three or four months. We are asking teachers in a severely, drastically altered learning environment to teach five quarters of loss in four, and we're gonna ask AZ Merit to be thrown upon them. It is absolutely crucial that AZ Merit either be significantly modified or it be waived for this year. We also have the 180 day school calendar rule that right now is paralyzing districts in terms of flexibility and not being able to be as flexible as they need to be with their schedules, with their school calendar to meet the needs of their employees, meet the needs of the students. And with these issues looming largely in April, it still vexes me as to why the legislature opted to wrap early with these huge issues. And, and this is not the governor, this is them. This is the legislature knowing that these issues were on the table in the middle of a closure, opting to wrap early is still very bewildering to me, but these issues are gonna be there when they get back and they should be the first order of business, of course, along with equalizing the funding on a per student basis for students that are in online uh, learning environments and those that are physically attending schools. I was in a round table recently uh, with, with, some, with, with a legislator and the conversation was, well, online learning is cheaper because you're not using as many buildings or buses. Wrong, I've cut teacher ratios. We're gonna be running like 12 to 14 per classroom. So guess what? I'm using the same amount of buildings. It's just fewer students. And I've gotta run double the routes because we're gonna end up putting one kid per seat. Uh, per the CDC recommendation. So all of these really big picture structural challenges are legislative challenges that uh, they knew about in April, chose not to do anything, wrapped early, and they're still here. So I, whatever legislature takes uh, their seats in January, I think these are gonna be three of the most pressing issues that uh, they've gotta be addressed pretty quickly. Well, I, for one, would like to commend you on your, le on your leadership. I know teachers around the state are applauding your remarks there. And we are just so lucky to have you in our network, and we're so grateful for your time. I think to sum everything it up, it sounds as though um, there is a plea for grace and there is a plea for leadership. I think our communities are learning to give each other grace and realize that it's not business as usual. It's a pandemic. and to treat each other with kindness and to try and do the best for our neighbors. And I'm hearing a huge plea for leadership. Um, and we are asking everybody who's viewing this amazing conversation to reach out to Senators McSally and Cinema and ask for federal, federal relief for our families, to reach out to the governor and ask him to take action as Dr. Trujillo just put it. So with that, I hope that you will go to our website um, and, and do exactly that. Um, so I think we can wrap it up there. David, did you want to give some closing remarks? I think you hit it. I, don't, I, I can't do any better than that. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. <laughs> thank you both so much. And thank you to our viewers at home. And let's make those phones ring off the hook. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Stay safe.